Hi everyone, my name is Maxim Chevalier Boivard and I'll be telling you about YJIT, a basic block versioning JIT compiler for CRuby. So, in today's talk, I'll first tell you a little bit about Ruby and optimization challenges, uh, why we've chosen to build YJIT inside of CRuby, lazy basic block versioning, which is the JIT compiler architecture that YJIT is based on, uh, some specifics about what we're doing to optimize Ruby, uh, finally, some performance results, and a little bit about future work. So why JIT? Uh, why not JIT? Uh, the name stands for uh, yet another Ruby JIT or YARV JIT because it compiles uh, YARV bytecode into machine code. And first of all, uh, this project is not just my project. Uh, it's a team project uh, by a team at Shopify in the Ruby and Rails infrastructure group with multiple major contributions from GitHub. So YJIT is an open source project uh, built at Shopify that we hope to upstream into CRuby. The main goal is to produce speed ups on real world software, not just synthetic benchmarks. Uh, in particular, uh, we're mostly concerned about web workloads such as uh, Ruby on Rails. The CRuby code base is very complex. And so we've chosen an approach where we're building a JIT compiler essentially inside of the interpreter and we're incrementally gradually adding more functionality. Uh, the benefits of our approach are that uh, YJ is basically a drop-in replacement uh, for an existing uh, CRuby binary, and it's very easy for us to stay up to date with upstream changes, which I think is, is highly underrated. So let's talk a little bit about Ruby. Uh, Ruby is a language that was inspired by Smalltalk and Perl. It's in the same broad category as Python, JavaScript, PHP, Lua, etc. So dynamic languages that have uh, dynamic typing and uh, late binding. It's an object-oriented language which has the same idea that everything is an object, uh, like in Smalltalk, and it also has classes and inheritance, as well as uh, functional constructs like uh, blocks, maps, filter, etc. And it has a numerical tower with uh, fixed nums, floating point numbers, and big nums. So there's this blog post that dates all the way back from 2012 that goes into uh, many of the optimization challenges uh, in uh, making Ruby faster. I think it's still pretty relevant. Uh, the things that we find are most notoriously difficult are uh, things like every operation on primitive types can be redefined. So you can redefine the meaning of uh, plus and minus. You can redefine the meaning of something like x equals not nil. Uh, you have classes, but you can re redefine methods at any time. Uh, constants are not actually constants. Callies can sometimes read and write locals inside of callers. Uh, the method call logic is highly complex. Uh, in CRuby, uh, there's 11 different kinds of method dispatch. So as you can imagine, that, that can make inlining very hard. Uh, and also, real-world code has lots of, of short methods. Uh, which makes inlining all the more necessary. Uh, but it's it's pretty difficult to do because of the reasons I just outlined above. And finally, there's the C extensions API. Um, a lot of code is written in C, which kind of imposes a, a barrier on what you can optimize in a, in a JIT compiler. Uh, Ruby has a situation uh, politically that's similar to, uh, to Python before uh, the PEP standardization process where Matsumoto is the BDFL who vets language changes, and CRuby is the reference implementation. Uh, with maybe one key difference, which is that the Ruby community has been uh, very welcoming of JIT compiler implementations and understands that they're important for uh, the future success of the language. And Matsumoto has expressed a desire for a faster JIT. So uh, by choosing to build a JIT compiler inside of CRuby, it means we must work with uh, some of the CRuby design choices, but we get instant compatibility with uh, existing Ruby packages, and it's a lot easier to uh, keep up to date with language changes. We also believe that uh, the Ruby community is receptive to improvements to design of CRuby that's gonna make it easier in the future to build uh, high-performance JIT compilers. So now I'll tell you a little bit about lazy busy block versioning which is uh, the JIT compiler architecture that YJIT is built upon. In Ruby, JavaScript, and Python, every primitive operation is potentially polymorphic. That means that 
the behavior of operators like plus and minus depends on the types of input operands. But the types of values are only in our runtime. So every primitive operation must include implicit dynamic type checks. We don't want to generate code for every possible input type for every, poss for every primitive operation though. What we'd like to do is to inline specialized versions of primitive operations. So what can we do to recover the type of input operands? We could use type analysis, but that could potentially be expensive, both in terms of time and memory, and sometimes imprecise. Uh, profiling is another alternative, but it's also sometimes imprecise, and it also has a runtime cost. So the problem that basic block versioning aims to solve is to find a way to recover accurate type information at low cost. So just to give you an example, this is the definition of the plus or addition operator inside the CRuby implementation. So as you can see in there, there's different type checks uh, with different cases for fixed num addition, floating point number addition, uh, string concatenation, and array concatenation. And you wouldn't want to have to inline this entire function every time someone uses the plus operator, because that would be inefficient, both in terms of compile time and in terms of runtime, yeah, because the compiler has to do a certain amount of work uh, to inline a function. So inside of every primitive operator, there's a lot of hidden complexity that the programmer doesn't see. So in terms of previous work, the first paper that uh, we published describes the basic interprocedural technique and makes the case for using uh, laziness. We've shown that it's effective on JavaScript benchmarks and that the code size remains under control. And with this intra-procedural technique, we were able to eliminate 71% of uh, dynamic type checks at the expense of a code size increase of 0.19% on average. In our second published paper, we've made several inter-procedural extension, including uh, versioning of method entry points, uh, speculation on uh, method return types, and also the use of type object shapes and its integration with basic block versioning. Uh, using these extensions, we were able to eliminate 94.3% of uh, type checks on average, uh, with a code size increase of 5.5% uh, in the worst case across all benchmarks. In this work, we present a simple JIT compiler based on basic block versioning that's integrated into CRuby. Uh, Ruby is a much more complex language than JavaScript. It has many more features and so many more corner cases and much more dynamic behavior, which makes it harder to optimize. Our compiler is simple. It doesn't have a register allocator yet, but our implementation is nearly 100% compatible with existing Ruby code packages, and it's been tested on real enterprise scale software with thousands of methods. It produces very fast warm up that's competitive even with the CRB interpreter and sizable speed ups compared to the interpreter and MJIT. And we take this to be early evidence that lazy busy block versioning can scale to quote unquote real software. Uh, it produces very fast warm up, uh, shows no pathological behaviors. But there's still a lot of overhead that we could shave off in CRuby uh, in order to allow uh, busy block versioning to really shine. So there's two key components of lazy busy block versioning. The first is the versioning of basic blocks, and the second is lazy code generation. So we do versioning of basic blocks so that we can accumulate and propagate type information and specialize basic blocks based on context. So that's selective tail duplication. Uh, and we know that the point of this is not to create uh, multiple versions of code, but it's really used as a tool to propagate information and keep track of it inside of uh, context objects. The second aspect is lazy code generation uh, so that we generate code only when it's needed, so truly just in time. And we capture type information as late as possible uh, when values flow in specific parts of a program. So this is lazy tail duplication and it's analogous to lazy evaluation for code. So just to look at a simple example, if we have an if statement uh, with a type check, if is fixed num of n, uh, and if the statement is true, we go to block b, otherwise we go to block c, and then we merge it in block d. In terms of a control flow graph, this looks something a little bit like this. So looking at this control flow graph, we have that in block B, we know that N is fixed num. In block C, we know that N is not a fixed num. So that when we merge in block D, we know that N is either fixed num or not a fixed num. So we know nothing at all. So the idea 
here is to do selective tail duplication so that we can preserve the fact that n is a fixed num in block d prime and that n is not a fixed num in block d prime prime. So that's it, right? Well, not quite. Because real control flow graphs in real world software can look something more like this. And as you can imagine, we can't do tail duplication for every conditional branch everywhere in the program because the code size would explode. So the key innovation here is the laziness. If we have a situation where the true branch is the only branch that's ever taken because n is always a fixed num, then we generate code only for the true branch, not for the false branch so that we don't actually increase code size because we only generate code for types that are seen at runtime. And in practice, what we see is that most base blocks only have one version generated. There is not a code size explosion. So lazy base block versioning looks superficially similar to tracing with some key differences. It doesn't record traces. It doesn't need an interpreter. It can be a pure JIT system. And it's not really focused on loop. It doesn't particularly care about loops in your program. I'm also going to note that tracing JITs look attractive, but they have multiple non-trivial edge cases, such as how do you handle a loop within a loop? How do you handle recursion? When do you decide to branch off new traces? And also the problem of trace explosions, if you have too many different paths inside of a loop. And I would say, having spoken to people who've worked on tracing JITs, that early tracing papers were kind of deceptive. They made the technique look really simple, but the complex hard problems were simply not discussed. These are the basic types that are currently tracked by YJIT, and they roughly correspond uh, to Ruby value types. So we have uh, immediates such as false, nil, true, uh, fixed point numbers, floating point numbers, and symbols, and heap objects such as array, hash, and strings. In terms of uh, speculation, the original paper on basic block versioning that we published at eCoop 2015 didn't do speculation because that wasn't strictly necessary for JavaScript. But in Ruby, it's more useful. Uh, we speculate that methods won't be redefined, that constants won't be redefined, that basic operators such as addition, subtraction, multiplication won't be redefined. And we discard generated machine code if those assumptions are broken. Uh, in a meta-based JIT, uh, Typically, people would discard entire methods and use on stack replacement. With basic block versioning, uh, we can replace individual blocks with stubs and recompile them later. We also use a technique known as runtime value promotion uh, because in a JIT compiler, we often want to specialize code based on runtime value types. And traditionally, JITs do this by profiling code first. So they have two implementations or two modes of uh, compilation. Uh, just has a baseline JIT that has profiling code and an optimizing JIT that doesn't. We use a technique that was originally pioneered in the psycho prototype for Python uh, and its unlift operator so that we can promote runtime values into compile time values. And we do this by deferring compilation using stubs. So we defer compilation as late as possible and we pause compilation basically until we can peek at the types of runtime values. Let's now look at some performance results. Uh, so these are the benchmarks that were used uh, in the paper. The 30k methods and 30k if else benchmarks are synthetic benchmarks that we wrote to test how Wajid performs in the presence of a very large amount of input code. So in those benchmarks, we have several thousand methods calling each other in a loop. And to our surprise, uh, the performance results are surprisingly good. What we originally expected was that uh, when there's a lot of code, we would get a lot of performance, uh, a lot of instruction cache misses and that would cause performance problems, but that hasn't turned out to be the case. Uh, the opt-carrot is a synthetic benchmark that's been very commonly used uh, in the Ruby community. So we include it uh, just because it's uh, it's become kind of traditional to use it, uh, but it's not really representative of real world code. Uh, the site load, liquid render, active record, and uh, Rails bench benchmarks are all based on our real world Ruby packages. And so they're more representative, we think, of uh, code as it's used in the wild, particularly for uh, web use cases. What we can see is that uh, on every benchmark, we managed to outperform the interpreter and MJIT. And on some benchmarks, we even outperformed Truffle Ruby. Uh, YJIT, because it behaves deterministically, uh, has a very small variance in terms of uh, performance results. Truffle Ruby has uh, 
much more sophisticated heuristics for deciding when to optimize, and it uses a background thread for compilation, which can sometimes lead to very high variance in uh, performance results. But perhaps most importantly, our biggest achievement, I think, is compatibility. Uh, so we've recently added support for uh, trace points, and we're passing all the C Ruby tests. We're also matching our Ruby head in the Shopify core uh, CI. We're matching Ruby head in terms of uh, tests in, in the GitHub backend CI, and also in the Shopify storefront renderer CI. And we're able to run, like I said, Shopify storefront renderer in production, uh, which is a big achievement. Let's talk a little bit about future work. Uh, in terms of future plans, we've been invited by the CRuby core developers to upstream widget into CRuby version uh, 3.1. Uh, so that's something that we're currently working on. We're also looking at bringing object shapes, uh, aka hidden classes, into CRuby because the current object model is very complex and not very efficient for JIT compilers. Uh, lastly, we're also looking at making uh, YJIT more portable, adding ARM64 support, and tackling uh, inlining and more sophisticated optimizations. So in conclusion, YJIT is a new JIT compiler built inside of CRuby. It uses basic block versioning uh, as a compiler architecture. Basic block versioning is like lazy evaluation for code. It tries to capture inf type information as late as possible and naturally li linearizes machine code. Uh, we've shown that we can produce modest but significant performance improvements over the interpreter and MJIT, but our biggest achievement is near 100% compatibility with uh, existing Ruby code and packages. So if you'd like to learn more about the technology, uh, there's uh, two published papers that uh, you can look at. I've put uh, the references here. There's also recording for the talks uh, for both of these papers on YouTube. And if you'd like to reach out to me, uh, here's my Shopify email address, and I'm also at uh, love to code on Twitter. Uh, so that's all for me. Thanks, everybody.